All right. Here is another interesting fact. We know that Albania and Kosovo are the largest European trafficking routes for drugs. Afghanistan, which has been occupied by NATO troops as well, is the largest drugs manufacturer. So we can see NATO's presence in both of these countries. Is this accidental or not? It isn't accidental. At present, the coalition troops, which are fighting against the Taliban on the territory of Afghanistan, are trapped in a certain way. We all know that it's mostly the Americans and the British who are fighting there against the Taliban. As for the others, their role is a kind of peaceful presence. Plus the Canadians. To some extent. Now, at a recent NATO summit, the Europeans declared that they wouldn't be sending their troops there at all. They said, our own mafia terrorists and glaivers formed in the heart of Europe and the formation of the Great Albania could start at any time. So it would make no sense to send forces into Afghanistan when they are expecting trouble in Europe at any moment. That's why it's a trap. On the one hand, the Americans need the support of the Europeans and on the other, they are wavering this support. As I said, contact between the Kosovo Albanian mafia and the Taliban in the area of drug dealing is based on the contact between the terrorist structures of bin Laden. They are identical to the structures of the Taliban, Mullah Omar and so on. These contacts have existed since the middle of the 90s. Drug production in Afghanistan has increased 25-fold since 2001. These contacts have improved significantly. You know, actually, the reason I ask this question is because it seems very logical that Afghanistan was the first country to recognize Kosovo's independence. Yes, it was Afghanistan. And then the leader of the organization of the Islamic Conference said that it was a large victory of the Muslim world and the Islamic world in general. There is another question that puzzles me. I've been reading in The Guardian an article. Patrick Winter wrote that last year Afghanistan produced more drugs than Colombia, Bolivia and Peru combined. After NATO troops overthrew the Taliban regime and practically occupied the country, the production of drugs has increased. How does this happen? It makes one think that NATO members are somehow involved in this criminal business. Of course, I wouldn't like to think about that. No, NATO is not directly involved with this business. Some individuals could be, but NATO officials turn a blind eye to this, preferring not to notice. They realize only too well that the moment they start fighting the drugs business, destroying poppy fields and heroin laboratories, their own allies, tribe leaders, and the corrupt local officials will strike them in the back. The whole of Afghanistan is one big drugs laboratory which employs the local police, the administration, tribe leaders and all of the other structures besides the Taliban. You're saying NATO doesn't participate in this directly, turning a blind eye to it. What makes NATO do so? Since the war in Vietnam, the CIA is known to have used illegal money, particularly money from various drug mafias, to fund some of its shadowy operations. Can we say that at least the revenue from this illegal business finances some semi-legal operations of the Western Special Services? No, the situation is different. When the Americans entered Afghanistan after 9-11, they faced very little resistance. It was because the U.S. Special Services had agreed with local warlords and tribe leaders that they would not oppose the U.S. Army. Well, demonstration strikes were carried out upon the Tora Bora region and some other camps, but that was it. Why? Because the Americans had made sure there wouldn't be any resistance at all. The Afghans want to live, and it's drugs that help them survive. There's virtually nothing manufactured in Afghanistan. The only source of revenue is money coming from the humanitarian aid and the billions generated by drugs production and trafficking.
There was quite a scandal recently about a book written by Carla del Ponte. In the book, she practically admitted that the facts had been known about Kosovo separatists abducting Serbs and selling the organs of Serbian prisoners of war. Do you think this scandal is going to develop, or is it going to fade away, as if nothing had happened? It has developed already, as many countries, as well as non-governmental and human rights organizations, have addressed the Hague Court and the Serbian authorities, demanding an investigation into these facts. Too bad Del Ponte didn't announce these facts before sovereignty was declared. Why didn't she? There are many reasons for that. Many people have a bad attitude towards Del Ponte. I was the first Russian citizen to get acquainted with her in 1994, when she was appointed the chief prosecutor of Switzerland. I was sent to Switzerland by the Home Affairs Ministry to study issues related to money laundering. Del Ponte is an honest person. As a matter of fact, when she was appointed to the Hague Tribunal, the Americans flooded her with evidence on Serb atrocities against others and about Milosevic's crimes. That was a civil war with plenty of crimes committed by both sides. In the course of the investigation, she found that more crimes had been committed against the Serbs and that satellite pictures of burial sites provided by the U.S. showed Serbian burials. The moment Del Ponte came to that conclusion and wanted to announce it, she was removed from the Hague Tribunal and sent to Argentina as an ambassador. And now she has published her book, which is an act of civil courage, I think. That's amazing. If those facts were truly known to Del Ponte herself, as well as many other facts, then we go back to where we started in our interview. We can say that the world's elite, spearheaded by the political and financial elite of the United States, has deliberately and knowingly created a bandit mafia state in the very heart of Europe, a state that is going to destabilize the whole situation. You see, the elite in the United States, in the West, is not homogeneous, it's rather split. After all, the statement by John Bolton, the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, was a sensation. And there hadn't been anyone more loyal to the Bush family than Bolton. And he said that the creation of an independent, mafia, terrorist state, to quote his words, in the center of Europe, by the United States, is its biggest mistake for decades. I agree with Bolton completely, and don't forget, Bolton belongs to the U.S. elite as well. Well, let's talk about President Bush. He may not be exactly the best president or the smartest of all politicians, but he's always busy looking for the good guys and the bad guys. He always says that the good guys must be helped and the bad guys must be whacked. Why is he doing the opposite in this case? That's because of the double standards policy. This is just a classic example of double standards. They are very well aware that those are bad boys, and yet they still help them. Let me explain why. This is because they understand that they need those bad guys to protect their energy interests. And energy concerns are above all. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this interview. Thank you very much for being with us. And just a reminder that I guess today was Vladimir Avchinsky, the advisor to the chairman of the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation and former head of the Russian Interpol Bureau. And that's it for now from all of us here. If you want to have your say on Spotlight or have someone in mind who you think I should interview next time, please drop me a line at algorinov at rttv.ru. And let's keep Spotlight interactive. We'll be back tomorrow with more first-hand comments on what's going on in and outside Russia. Until then, stay on Russia Today and take care. Thank you.